happy to be able to kick off um, uh, the colloquium seminar series for this academic year. Our very first speaker for this year is Corona Burke, and I'm very, very happy that she's here. Corona and I have known each other for five years now. Five years, six years, many, yeah. many years. <laughs> and um, we actually have a huge overlap in research. For the last four years, we've been organizing this workshop um, that I told you about once in a while um, in Telluride on thermodynamics. Of, uh, what's the title? <sighs> Some of the of information the Nanoscale. <laughs> so, we should know the title of our workshop. Um, na uh, something at the frontiers of nanoscale uh, ter information engines. Yes. Information engines, tiers of the scale, dynamics, yeah. Which means we mostly focus on the thermodynamic properties of small systems that um, process information. Now, Corona actually has a background in dynamic systems. It is much more into the nitty-gritty details of understanding how chaos um, can be used in order to um, optimize processes, thermodynamic devices, things what she will be talking about. But she's actually much, much broader than that. I always keep thinking how many degrees you have, but she has a background in chemistry and physics, and she actually started out at Berkeley um, doing experimental plasma physics before yeah. she was at yeah. working on similar things like that. From UC Merced, she moved directly to Davis, where she started working in the Complex Systems Center, working with Jim Crutchfield, who's going to be here in a couple of weeks, really worked thinking about how to transfer her knowledge in physics and chemistry in order to be able to say something useful in applied, system, uh, in applied math and dynamical systems. For about two years now? One yeah, year? two years? I don't know, something like that. Uh, she's moved her office from the physics building to the math building, where she's um, 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 a lecture, teacher, yeah. teaching professor in the UC system, um, teaching math classes, but she's still very, very involved in the, the graduate education um, of physics students. I'm so, very glad that you're here. I'm very happy. And I'm looking forward to your talk. The stage is all yours. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I am really happy to uh, come here and visit you guys, and uh, I had some great conversations all throughout the day today. So um, I'm going to talk about today uh, how you can understand the ionization of Rydberg atoms using these geometric structures that exist in phase space. So my hope is that by the end of the talk, this picture that looks kind of cool, I think, and very intricate and maybe puzzling, you'll be able to understand what this picture means. So as Sebastian said, I'm currently at UC Davis, and I found out just a week ago that Davis is one of the few schools in the UC system, actually the only school in the UC system that doesn't allow me to use the seal anymore. So I'm just using our, uh, <laughs> our Aggie horse so you know where I'm from. So um, the, the reason why I want to include this uh, figure right here, and this is one of my favorite things, is um, because people usually say, OK, exactly what do you do? Where do you sit? What do you do? Uh, what are you interested in? So I would like to say that even though I do a lot of dynamical systems and I go to a lot of math conferences, so I sit kind of right here. This guy is not. Push, pulling me down, but I am kind of looking this way. I'm going towards reality. I'm not a math person who, you know, just sits at her desk and tries to think about very esoteric things, which is actually hilarious because the recent paper that I submitted, which was invited to a math journal, one of the referees wrote that uh, this is not math, this is mathematical physics. So give me your opinion at the end of the, <laughs> the talk. So, so some very basic background. So when I started interested, uh, started getting interested in chaos, um, I did a little bit of sleuthing because I was interested when exactly people started thinking about chaos. We all know about the famous problem about Poincaré and trying to solve the three-body problem. But it turns out that in Greek mythology, they were already using a word chaos, and they meant that chaos is a dark void from which everything else appeared. Which to me right now that I've been working in this field for a really long time seems very insightful because we can find chaos on every single scale in, physic in physics. Plato used it for uh, to mean disorder and random, and I kind of blame him for introducing this common misconception what a chaotic system usually means. A lot of people think when, when you go out and talk to a random person on the street, and if you say that you're studying chaos, they will think you're studying something random. 
which is not true. <laughs> So in modern science, actually, and uh, you are really close to where the birth of the modern uh, study of chaos is, which a lot of it happened at University of Maryland College Park. So Jim York started uh, thinking uh, and using the word chaos for a specific kind of unpredictability, even though it was Lawrence who first started um, in the uh, in the early 1900s thinking about the chaotic systems when he was studying weather patterns. So. A lot of you um, in this room might be familiar with these types of pictures when you are looking at nonlinear and chaotic systems, or you might be familiar with these kinds of pictures. So as I said, chaos exists on all sorts of different length scales where the similar features appear if whether you're looking at the hurricanes or whether you're looking at the types of galaxies. And you can explain these shapes look using nonlinear dynamics. So what is the sim one of the simplest examples of a uh, chaotic system is if you take a pendulum that we all uh, study in regular um, classical mechanics class, first thing that you, when you start studying pendulum, everybody says, let's do small angle approximation. <laughs> and when you do the small angle approximation, this is a linear system. But if you take this very simple pendulum and you start looking at the large angles or you start driving this pendulum, or even more fun, if you attach a, se a second pendulum to it, so now you have a double pendulum, you get a chaotic system. So people in my field study very, um, uh, study a lot of different, uh, as I said, uh, chaos on a lot of different scales, and they also study various different aspects of chaos. So there is peop there are one, some of the most fun talks to not only at nonlinear dynamics conferences when I go to, at least for me, are the people who study um, stuff that you guys have here, but we are lacking in Davis, which is thunderstorms. And it turns out that uh, you have really nice fractal structures when you're uh, studying thunderstorms, and you can explain a lot of these features and formations using nonlinear dynamics. I tend to teach a lot of um, intro calculus classes to biology students, and there I talk a lot about Lotka-Volterra models, which is predator-prey models. They're also chaotic. This is a little bit old picture, so I'm sure a lot of things are missing in here, uh, what the current social network um, um, uh, world is right now, but there's, there are a lot of people who are studying network dynamics. They're studying how information propagates throughout the networks, how rumors spread and, uh, and such things. And then all of you here are sitting uh, in front of me. You're listening, you're taking notes, your brain is doing processing, and your neurons are behaving chaotically. <laughs> so there's chaos on all sorts of different scales, different length scales, different tools are used to study all of these things. What my, you might have noticed, so this picture on the left right here is I was, I forget where I was exactly, but I, I drink tea and I poured some milk in the tea and for some reason it works really well with uh, black tea. You start getting these patterns that form and you can actually see this really nice um, rolls happening and you can start seeing structures in your a cup of tea if you pour milk careful into it. Uh, my camera wasn't that great so I quickly just jumped on the, online and I found this even better picture uh, of somebody pouring uh, milk into tea and you start, you notice these very wonderful lines and structures that you observe in your mug. So you can go play with um, these geometric structures that appear in nonlinear systems just by having tea every day. And it's a lot of fun. So, but what are these different types of structures that people study? So people uh, look at fixed points, they look at periodic orbits, and they look at limit cycles. This is my favorite textbook on this type of study, and I really like its cover because it has most of these features labeled here. So these points right here at the centers, uh, 
are what's called types of fixed points. And the fixed point, if you're looking at the continuous dynamical system, is nothing else but the, the point that doesn't appear to move, which is different than if you're looking at the discrete dynamical system. Discrete dynamical system, if you, if you discretize a continuous dynamical system, you have to be careful because the fixed point in that case means a periodic orbit. Another thing that people look at are what are called KM tori, and these would be these closed loops that you see in this picture. And KM tori are important because you can use them to study barrier, they, they behave as barriers to transport to your system in phase space. What I spend most of the time looking at are the homoclinic and heteroclinic tangles, and I'm going to tell you in a little bit of time what they actually are. But they, act on this picture, they will be these squiggly lines that form these really cool patterns, and you might recognize it a little bit from the um, title of the talk. Some of you in here might also be familiar with what are called Lagrangian coherent structures, and these are used a lot when we're looking at uh, the transport of uh, materials, for example, in ocean, or when you, we are looking even sometimes in atmosphere. Okay, so these are the types of structures that uh, we care about when we're talking about dynamical systems. So this approach has been used in various different fields. So people use it in celestial mechanics. Uh, it's used a lot in fluid mixing. Uh, it's been very useful in looking at the, the escape from optical and microwave cavities. Uh, it's been crucial in designing a tokamaks. So if you're looking at plasma physics and figuring out exactly how to design your tokamak, these structures have been uh, crucial in doing that. And what I'm working on is this chaotic ionization of Rydberg atoms. So, um, we use these structures to mostly understand the dynamics of the system. So why do I care about studying chaos in atoms? So I'm the type of a person, as I said before, I'm always looking towards the reality part. So I like to do a lot of theory, but I also want to see whether or not I have gone completely into the deep end uh, or whether or not what I'm working on actually is representing a physical system. And what's beautiful about atoms is atomic physicists have been great and they have made it so that atoms are relatively accessible uh, lab tools that we can play with. And they're really responsive to application of external fields. And what I put this in quotation marks, and um, if you're experimentalists, don't get offended for us theorists thinking that this is easy. Um, but they're relatively easy to isolate from external influences, and they're relatively easy to control. And then why do I study Rydberg atoms and not just any old atom? So what's nice about a Rydberg atom is it sees hydrogen-like potential. So my potential is really simple. The electrons behave classically, which means as a theorist, I don't have to worry about quantum mechanics. They have really long classical Kepler periods. So I can do a lot of stuff in, for example, if I'm working with N equals 350, its Kepler period is six and a half nanoseconds. So there's a lot of stuff I can do to this atom during one Kepler period. Again, as I said, they're responsive to application of external fields. And in the past, they have been shown to be good test beds for studying both classical and quantum chaos. And as you know, Rydberg atoms have been studied now for quite a while, so they're also readily accessible in lab. So I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk talking about classical Rydberg atoms. Okay, so what is a one-dimensional hydrogen atom? So you might think I'm crazy. I mean, we, we've learned a lot of these different things, and now I'm gonna tell you about the classical one-dimensional atoms. What, what is this? So if you think about just a, a classical hydrogen atom, you have a proton and you have an electron. And if you remember a little bit from your classical mechanics, uh, if I wanna take a one-dimensional limit, of this atom, and if I want to do it in a way where I'm preserving the energy of the electron, what that is equivalent to is looking at the semi-major axis of this ellipse, because the semi-major axis of the ellipse is directly related to the energy of the 
um, the energy shell that the electron is on. So the way that I take the one-dimensional limit is I keep the length of the same semi-major axis constant and I squish down the ellipse. So what that does is that the proton moves closer to one of the turning points of the ellipse. And when I take the full one-dimensional limit, now I have collapsed this onto the length of the line that has the length of the semi-major axis of the original ellipse, where the proton is at the one end of the line, and then the electron moves just back and forth. And then you have this very simple classical one-dimensional Hamiltonian where you have the kinetic and potential energy part. And I'm just working in atomic units, so a lot of these constants are equal to one. So throughout the talk, was there a question? Okay, so throughout the talk, uh, Whenever the electron is moving away from the proton, I'm going to say it has positive momentum, and when it's moving towards the proton, I'll say that it has negative momentum. And then what you can do is you can look at the phase space of this very, very simple system. And what you notice is this is the momentum versus position. So when the electron energy is less than zero, we know that electron is bound. So these purplish looking lines are bound orbits. And you can trace one of these orbits. So the electron, this is the classical turning point right here, so it would be right there. You release it and it starts moving towards the proton, it speeds up, it gets to the proton, bounces off, and then it repeats this motion over and over again. If you keep increasing the energy, the classical turning point moves further and further away from the proton, and then you reach energy equals zero, and now the turning point is at infinity, and this is a special type of an orbit called the separatrix, and this is going to become important later in the talk. And if you further increase the energy, then now you have the unbound orbits. Okay, so this is very simple. So, let, we're going to use that picture to see where my motivation came from to study these types of problems. And then I'm going to tell you how you can use the chaotic ionization to understand, um, so you can use the homoclinic angle to understand the chaotic ionization. And we're going to spend some time on looking at the observation of the uh, homoclinic angle in the Rydberg experiment. And I'm going to show you that this approach actually works for the energies that are actually quite close to the quantum regime. And depending on how many questions you have, we might get to this part right here. So, okay, so uh, this was before I started grad school, but uh, when I started grad school, um, I was trying to decide what I really want to do. and. Nonlinear dynamics seemed like a lot of fun, and uh, my advisor gave me a couple of papers to read. And one of the papers was this paper where they observed the stable islands in an atomic system. So what is a stable island? So a stable island would be this closed loop right here, or this closed loop, or this closed loop, or this closed loop. And why do we care about these stable islands? So stable means that they're stable, but what they're important for is if you start, if you were to start your electron ensemble inside a stable island, it would remain in the stable island forever. So a stable island is a barrier to transport. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so I started reading more, and then. It turns out that this is coming out of Barry Dunning's group at Rice, who ended up eventually becoming my collaborator. They said, okay, let's see if we can observe stable islands in what the system that we have in our lab. So they decided we're gonna do a very simple experiment where we're gonna create a one-dimensional Rydberg atom quasi-one-dimensional Rydberg atom. And in one set of experiments, what we're gonna do is we're going to apply electric field pulses that apply the uh, that kick the electron away from the nucleus periodically, and that's going to be 
on this set right here of pictures. And we're going to then do the different experiment. We're just going to periodically apply the kicks towards the nucleus. And that would be this set of experiments right here. So what you see is, so here I have no kicks applied. And I just see the energy shells. And then I start applying stronger and stronger um, kick away from the nucleus, and the energy shells dissolve. But if instead of kicking away from the nucleus, I start kicking towards the nucleus, I start seeing the appearance of these islands. So I thought that was really, really, really cool. And what I really liked as an explanation that uh, Barry wrote, I forget if he wrote it in this paper or a different paper, the easiest way to think about this is think about you have a tennis ball that's going like this, and then you periodically either take a racket and go like this, or you take a racket and go like this. So if you're constantly kicking it this way, you're going to dissolve everything, your tennis balls are going to go away. But if you periodically kick it this way, if you just catch it at the right frequency, you're going to have a tennis ball that's going to go between your racket and the board. So that's why you get these stable islands forming. So another set of ex examples when people were looking at how can we observe the chaos in atomic system came from uh, John DeLoss, and he was looking at slightly different approach to understanding um, these um, chaos in an atomic system. So he was looking at the oscillations and the photoabsorption spectra. And what he was uh, able to do, he was able to see, look at the closed orb orbits that form uh, in a particular system and use the existence of various closed orbits to predict the oscillations in the photoabsorption spectra. But then, the thing that got me really, really excited came out of, uh, as I said, Barry Dunning's group, is how can you use these stable islands to trap and control the wave packets? So they had this idea that if I were to create a wave packet and then turn on the outside fields that create these islands, then I will be able to use the island which is a barrier to transport to control the wave packet. And they actually were able to do this a little bit later, but creating what's called the Trojan wave packet. So what they've done is they've loaded a wave packet inside the stable island, and then they move the stable island in a circular fashion around the nucleus, and they created a Bohr atom, essentially. Yes? You talked about wave packets, but you said you weren't going to consider quantum. So I'm not. This is this is what they've done. This was kind of inspiring what I was going to start working with them on. The question is, quantum mechanics is linear, so there isn't any real chaos. Yeah, but you're you're creating chaos by uh, applying eternal, external fields. That's what creates chaos in the system. I'm applying external electric field, which couples to the system, and they. That coupling is a nonlinear coupling. That's what's creating nonlinearity. <laughs> but also, the um, the other thing that you can think of is I am so. Stop me if I'm not completely answering your question. Uh, so the other thing is we are we are looking at really high end values. So we're thinking about this classically. So I'm. I have the, I'm going to show you in just a second what the, um, the Hamiltonian looks like, but the Hamiltonian will have a nonlinear term. And that's where nonlinearity comes from. Is that answering? Okay. Perfect. But anyway, so they were able to create a Bohr atom. And not only that, but they were able to get this Bohr atom to persist for many, 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 many oscillations. Um, um, of the, um, for many, many, many Kepler periods. And they were also able to use the existence of stable islands to manipulate the wave packet. So change 
exactly where it was in phase space and how localized it was. Because once when you put the wave packet inside the, um, the, the stable island, if I shrink this island slowly, then I'm also squeezing the wave packet as well because it cannot cross the stable island. So those were the things that got me really excited. I see a lot of skeptical <laughs> faces. Um, okay, so those, so when I saw what their capability was, I decided, okay, let's see, can we use the experimental setup that they have to study some of these other geometric features that occur in the system. So I did some simplifications. As I said, I'm modeling a classical system, not a quantum system. I'm modeling classical hydrogen atom instead of just doing the full Rydberg, which is a very good approximation. I also assumed that the electron has no angular momentum because they're very good at creating these um, highly, highly elongated um, uh, atoms, and then I'm also going to uh, model uh, external applied electric field pulses as square, square wave pulses. And then the other thing I'm going to do is instead of tracking the full orbit of the electron, I am going to introduce a discrete time map. So I'm going to introduce the Poincaré return map by taking stroboscopic snapshots of the system uh, that are equally spaced in time. And all that means is I'm going to record the electron position and momentum, and then I'm going to close my eyes, wait for some time, and then when I open my eyes, I'm going to record electrons position and momentum again. So this is going to be my map. I'm just going to be recording these two dots. So let's go back to our very simple system where the um, electron was not being kicked. So uh, that was our unkicked hydrogen atom, one dimensional hydrogen atom. So if I'm sitting there and blinking, one of the points that I'm going to see not moving is the turning point of the separatrix. And the way to understand that is out at infinity, the electron feels no coulomb potential, so it's also not moving. So I'm blinking, it's just going to be staying there. But I'm also going to notice that there's going to be a set of points that asymptotically approach this fixed point that's at infinity, and that is what's called the stable manifold. And here it's labeled in red. And also, if I run my movie backwards, I'm going to notice that there is a set of points that in the negative time direction maps to this fixed point at infinity, and that's what's called an uh, unstable manifold. And when I don't have any applied uh, external fields, the system looks trivial, and the stable and unstable manifolds overlap with each other, and they also overlap with the separatrix. And remember, separatrix was this boundary between the bound and unbound orbits. So now I'm going to take this very simple system, and I'm going to apply this set of kicks to it. So I'm going to have positive and negative kicks, which are going to be separated by some amount of time. And halfway through the positive kick, I'm going to record electrons position momentum. So this thick red line is my map. So one iterate of my map means apply half of the positive kick to the electron, wait for some time, apply full negative kick, wait for some time, and apply the rest of the positive kick. So what happens in that case, this very simple picture we had here turns into this picture. So the stable and unstable manifolds do not overlap with each other anymore, but they, call, they create this structure which is called the homoclinic tangle. And this structure will allow me to understand the ionization in the system. So if I'm going to create, yes? You said you were showing the so I'm still hung up on the question. So you have an electric field. Yes. Do you ever get that to be normal? Hold on a second. <laughs> um, um, so, so the system, so what, what we mean, so you get, I'm, I'm not just looking what happens to the electron when I have the electric field on. I'm looking what happens 
from the center to the center of the positive pulse. That's okay. <laughs> so when I, if I want to look at the stable and unstable manifolds, I need to first find the fixed point. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Huh? Okay. <laughs> um, so I need to find first the fixed point. So the fixed point, uh, it turns out it's still at infinity. And the easiest way to think about that, at an infinity, as I said again, there's no Coulomb potential. So if I give electron half of the positive kick, then it's moving away from the nucleus, let it move for some time. If I give it a full negative kick, all that does is it reverses the sign of the momentum. So when I wait the same amount of time and give it the rest of the positive kick, it comes back to the point where it started. Yes? So when you're going away, you still experience the point. But this point is out at infinity. So 1 over r is 0. <laughs> It's already at infinity. Yes. This point is out at infinity. Which means it's not part of the system. Sure. Technically not. It's at that edge where. Um, so anyway, so this is my um, this is my fixed point. And now it is stable and unstable manifolds. They define this region in phase space, which are called lobes. A lobe is a region that on one side is bounded by the stable manifold and on the other side is bounded by the unstable manifold. And here I colored one of them in. So why do I care about these lobes? Well, it turns out that if the electron is anywhere inside this E minus 2 lobe, which I, which I labeled, and I apply the one iterate of my map to that electron, it's going to map to the E minus 1 lobe. So everything inside this E minus 2 lobe, after one application of the map, is going to map into the E minus 1 lobe. And nowhere else. So these ma lobes map into each other. And then the E minus 1 lobe is going to map into the E0 lobe. But E minus 1 lobe had bound electrons in it, and E0 lobe has unbound electrons. So the ionization is nothing else but the mapping from the E minus 1 lobe to the E0 lobe. And it turns out that if you were to place the electron anywhere just outside the E minus 1 lobe, you would need to apply many, 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 many more iterates of the map to get that electron ionized. Whereas if you're inside E minus 1 lobe, you need to apply just one iterate of the map. So there is a big difference on where you are in phase space when you're applying the map, whether or not you're going to get ionized. Electron with the same energy, if it's inside the E minus 1 lobe, gets ionized after one application. If it's outside the E minus 1, it gets ionized after many applications of the uh, minus one, uh, so the subscripts are actually how many um, applications of the map until you get ionized. So if I'm inside the E minus two, I need two applications of the map to get ionized. So one, two, so I put the subscript minus two. Yes, I don't understand. So the map here I'm defining is half of the positive kick, weight, negative kick, weight, the rest of the positive kick. That's one iterate of the map. OK, so you can think of this homoclinic tangle as a leaky separatrix. And if you were to then take the E0 lobe and map it forward, it will map to E1 lobe, which is still ionized. And if you keep mapping it forward, it will just keep marching here above the stable manifold. So it will never become bound again. So you can then see that the size and shape and position of these lobes in phase space is what's govern, what governs your ionization process. So if you understand that, you can understand the ionization process. So as a good physicist, what you do is you treat it perturbatively. <laughs> you start with your system, which was easy, and you say, yes? 
So why does it choose to go from E1 to E2 and not like other adjacent lobes? We can talk about that later. That's a, that's a much longer um, uh, discussion. But the idea, the uh, over, overall idea of that is that it turns out that this intersection between stable and unstable manifolds maps to this intersection of the stable and unstable manifolds. And this uh, intersection right here maps to this intersection right here. And that means that this maps to this, and this maps to this, and that defines the area of phase space, which maps to another area of phase space. So anyway, so I start with the unperturbed system, I treat my kicks as the perturbation, and then you can find the lobe area by integrating the, the separation in energies between the stable and unstable manifolds between the two consecutive intersections. And this is what's called the Melnikov method. So the Melnikov method means you find what's called the Melnikov function, which is the integral over all times uh, of the Poisson bracket between the unperturbed Hamiltonian and the perturbation to the Hamiltonian integrated, integrated along the unperturbed stable or unstable manifold, which in our case was the separatrix of the just hydrogen atom. So this measures the splitting in energy between the stable and unstable manifolds. So once when I get this function and I find the zeros of that function, I can integrate between the two consecutive zeros and I have my lobe area. So this is my Hamiltonian. This was the unperturbed part. This is my perturbation right here. And in this case, the perturbation is relatively simple because it's either positive or negative, constant or a zero. Which gives you, and we know what my uh, unperturbed stable or unstable manifold would, which was just an equation of a separatrix. And this gives you the Melnikov function. So don't worry about how messy all of this looks like. The reason why I put this up here is because this is your Melnikov function. It has four terms in it, and each term corresponds to your kicks being turned on or off. But then you can look at this function, and you notice that the amplitude of this Melnikov function depends linearly on the kicking strength, how hard you're kicking the system. So that means that the length of the lobe depends linearly on how hard you're kicking the system. And you can also see that the zeros of the Melnikov function occur when t is equal to n times your kicking period, and m is either integer or half integer. So I know now where my intersections are, so I know where my lobes are in phase space. So let's look at it. Um, does this actually make sense? So, and I'm going to show you how we saw this in the experiment. So if I now take my turnstile, and here I'm just showing you E minus 1 lobe, and I plot it in the energy time coordinates, where the energy is the energy of the electron, and time is the time that it takes the electron to reach the nucleus, then the E minus 1 lobe looks like this. What I can do then is I can do the numerical experiment where I keep everything constant, but all I'm doing is I'm increasing the how hard I'm kicking the system. And what you see is where these intersections are, that doesn't change. All that's happening is that E minus one lobe is getting stretched. Remember what I said before, only what's inside the E minus one lobe gets ionized after one application of the map. Meaning that if my kicking strength is low, I will get no ionization, and then I increase it, and then I'll get tiny little bit of ionization because now I have a little bit of overlap right here. And then I'm gonna get a whole bunch of ionization when my kicking strength is 0.4 in this case, and then the amount of ionization is not going to change drastically anymore even if I keep increasing how hard I'm kicking the system. 
That's interesting. <laughs> also, what happens is, remember the intersections between the stable and unstable manifolds depended on either integer or half integer multiple of this. So if I'm increasing the period of my kicking, all that's going to do is going to move the turnstile lobe to the left and it's gonna make it wider. And that's exactly what we see when it's happening. So these are the numerical experiments. I can also then use the Melnikov function, and as I said, I can calculate the area of the lobe by integrating it between the two consecutive zeros, and we get that the lobe area is just some factor times linear dependence on how hard I'm kicking and period of how I'm kicking to the two-thirds power. And you do a little bit of numerical measuring of the, all the areas, and you get that indeed it does go to the two-thirds power. So this is theory part. Yes? Sorry for being No, no, no. Where exactly does the nonlinearity come <laughs> So the nonlinearity comes from the fact that it's, you're really dependent on where you are in phase space when I apply electric field to you. So you said I would see that in the Hamiltonian, but the Hamiltonian was nice and linear. And you have a Poisson factor, which is also nice and linear. That happens. Let's look at here. Let's look at the actually. Let's look at the picture forward. Um, where is the full? Mm, let me just. Uh, it's easiest to explain it with this figure right here. Okay, so let's look at what happens just right here versus just right here. Is that okay? Okay, so if I am just right here, I apply first half of the positive kick. So I apply half of the positive kick, and so that means that I shifted it up. Is that okay? And now I let it go, so what's gonna do? It's gonna come like this. And then I am going to apply the full negative kick, and it's gonna come, it's gonna bring it down. And then, it's gonna do its own thing, and then I'm gonna apply the positive kick and it's gonna end up right there. If I look at the point that's just to, to the left right here, I do the same thing, I lift it up, but now I'm gonna end up in a slightly different point right here, and when I shift it down, I'm gonna end up in a slightly different point right here, and when I kick it back up, I'm not gonna make it into here. So I have this re very, um, uh, very specific dependence on the initial conditions. And how do I see the exponential functions? Expo explanation what? Exponential divergence. So the exponent, I mean, you will see it by the, just, you, you can put two points in here and just map them forward and you'll see them exponentially diverging. The distance between them exponentially diverging. Um, Question. Yes. I guess um, I'm trying to understand, uh -huh. you explain this is a pure system, it's unpredictable. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me it's, it's it's deterministic chaos. It's deterministic chaos. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Was, uh, so the uh, yeah, go ahead. I was uh, trying to understand the it's a chaos system, right? So it's unpredictable. Right? <laughs> Everything is predictable. Yes. Yeah. So so that's a common misconception about the chaotic system. Chaos does not mean unpredictable necessarily. <laughs> It means that I have this sensitivity to initial conditions. Uh, and the type of chaos that I'm studying is deterministic chaos, which means that I have all the equations right there. And I know exactly where my electron is gonna be 
at some time later. But two electrons next to each other, instead of following each other the whole time, are going to diverge drastically from each other. That's, that's the nonlinear part right here. Okay, so I told you the story, but let's how we can actually see this story in the system. So let's start with variation of the kick strength. So what I said is no ionization here, a little bit, a lot, and then um, not increasing very much. And this is what happens, is if I am looking at the, so this is the numerical experiment, I'll show you an uh, actual experiment in just a second. If I'm tracing the kick strength here versus ionization fraction, I see I have no ionization, then I have this rapid rise in the ionization and then this slow increase, uh, followed by another slow increase. So you see that the initial rise is independent of my period of the kicking. There is a shoulder for small times, and we can talk about that if we have time later. And then I have this leveling off for the ionization. So, as I said, Barry Dunning was able to uh, do this in a lab. And this is their, the sketch of their lab setup. So they have the alkali um, beam that's getting into the cavity that isolates it from the um, outside world. Uh, they excite in here the electrons into the 306 or 350D uh, state, so highly elongated, highly excited uh, atoms. And then at the top here, there's a half pulse electrode, and you, we can use this electrode to apply the kicks to the electrons. And this is what they see. These, these are actual experimental results. So you see the independence on the kicking period. You see the slow, fast, slow rise of the ionization. So you can say, OK, I'm not fully convinced yet. And I agree, these are not maybe the nicest results, but better ones are coming. So. We're going to go do a different experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to start, with, again, with this highly excited quasi-one-dimensional Rydberg atom. We're going to produce a uniform distribution along an energy shell. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply a small, what we're calling a focusing kick. We're going to wait for some delay time d. We're going to apply just one iterate of the map. And then we're going to measure survival probability. So what's going to happen is that this focusing kick which is negative, it's equivalent to taking this uh, energy shell and just shifting it downward. But all that does is it speeds up these electrons and slows down these electrons. So if you wait for some time, these electrons that have sped up are going to catch up to the electrons that slow down, and you're going to get focusing in phase space. So this is what we're going to do. So here is going to, you're going to see what's happening to the electrons in relationship to the E minus 1 lobe. And over here, you're going to see the trace of the survival probability as a function of delay time d. What you see is when I just applied the focusing kick, I get a good overlap between the E minus 1 lobe and my electron distribution. So I have pretty good ionization fraction right there. And now we let it go. The electrons are now getting focused inside. Uh, they're getting um, outside the energy shell. I have no survival probability. Now they focus inside the uh, E minus 1 lobe. I get full ionization, almost full ionization. They move outside the E minus 1 lobe, get almost no ionization. They come back into the E minus 1 lobe, and my survival probability again drops close to zero, and this keeps repeating itself. And what's important to know is that the survival probability has a strong periodic signature. And these oscillations in the survival probability are nothing but the motion of the electron ensemble in and out of the turnstile. And this oscillation period is roughly equal to the Kepler period of the original energy shell that you started with. So. 
this is what is going to what is happening. As I said at the beginning, you have some overlap, then you have no overlap. So survival probability is close to one. You have really big overlap, survival probability drops to zero, and then they move out, and you have then survival probability close to one again. And these are the experimental results. So on the left here is for n equals 306, and for the right, it's n equals 350 case. And you see that in all of the cases, the survival probability is periodic in the, as a function of delay time. What you see is that this period is independent of the kicking period. So we repeated this for various kicking periods. And all that changes is for n equals 306, smaller Kepler period, faster oscillations. For n equals 350, uh, lo longer Kepler period, so larger oscillations. And then what you notice is, which is, which is a crucial, we're going to understand in just a second, is if I look at the phase of these oscillations, it increases with increasing kicking period. And remember, increasing kicking period is moving my E minus one lobe away from the nucleus. So let's understand, um, so this periodicity we already uh, understood with um, the previous movie, but let's look at why the average value and the amplitude of the survival probability are actually nearly constant. So for that, we're going to go back to this picture right here. So the average ionization probability is nothing else but the overlap between the starting energy shell and the E minus 1 lobe divided by 2 pi, because 2 pi in my case is the length of the Kepler period when I scaled everything out. So when I look at this, for five nanoseconds, I have this overlap, and then I have a little bit from those horns, that the horn-looking uh, horn things that are wrapping around the nucleus. If I increase, remember, kicking period, it moves the turnstile lobe away from the nucleus, and I see it moves away from the nucleus, but its length hasn't really increased much. And then I move it again. Here is now more horns are wrapping around, and now I move it again and I have more horns wrapping around. And what you get is that this is my prediction just by looking at these lengths, and this is the experimental predictions, right? Experimental measurements of these values. And so let's now look at the phase as well. So the phase is increasing. And the phase you can understand by looking at the kind of center of mass of these escape segments. And when you look at this center of mass and you compare it to experimental results, you can look at the experimental and our predictions, they line up pretty well. So as the kicking period is increasing, the turnstile is shifting, and that corresponds to the phase shift in the, uh, phase shift in the experimental data. So to our knowledge, this was the first time anybody was able to see the signature of the homoclinic tangle in any type of an experiment. And this was really exciting. Um, I had to redo analysis of the data five times because I couldn't believe how good it was, <laughs> how well they were um, getting on top of each other. Okay, so the mini conclusions part is that this existence of the homoclinic tangle, it allows you to understand what's actually happening in, in your system. So what's happening in phase space has direct experimental signature. So this motion in and out of turnstile tells you, you can see it by periodicity of the survival probability. Turnstile width tells you the average ionization probability. And the turnstile shift gives you the phase shift in the survival probability. Okay, so we worked on this, it was published, and then, you know, I'm looking through my RSS feed, and in 2014, this paper popped out, and it piqued my interest, because they said ionization of excited atoms by intense single cycle terahertz pulses. Pretty much what I was doing, but on a different scale. But what is really interesting is, what they were looking at 
they were looking at 6D to 15D. And they, they were seeing these signatures. They, the only difference is, what's different, I'm gonna show you in a second, is what they have done is they have not, they have, they have plotted here versus um, the actual field that they were applying versus I scaled out the field. So I scaled it in a, because if you're on, on a different energy shell, I can, I can scale out the end to, to plot all the energy shells on top of each other. So what they saw is slow, fast, so slow rise, and they saw the ionization saturation. And I took, D is the D orbital. Just a single, this, this, this is the pulse that they applied. How much is long uh, oh, what do you mean? Uh, this is a they they applied this to a six D orbital, so elongated orbital like this. Yeah, it's just energy of the six D orbital. Yeah. Um, so th this is what I've seen as the ionization probability. So I took from what I could tell the best the 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 numbers that they're using they were using. And I used my, and I plotted this to, um, to try to resemble their data. And you see, as I said, I haven't talked to them yet, so I, ha I don't know exact numbers, but you see a quantitative behavior in both of them. So even though quantum mechanics is starting to play a role here, because we're definitely talking about low end values, there are still these classical structures that persist and definitely have influence on such a low, for so, in such low end values right there. When you're looking at... Uh, that, that I have some idea what, where it's happening from and it could be coming from two different things. One is it could be that I didn't calibrate correctly to what they were, had in a paper because I had to guess on some of the things that they were doing in the paper. And there's another thing is it could be that um, there are some quantum effects here happening that I haven't thought about. So those are the two different things. Okay, so since it's 4.30, let's end with this. And if anybody's interested, I can talk to you about a different uh, thing as well. So it turns out that you can use this homoclinic tangle to understand the ionization. And there's a lot more that I haven't talked about here, but you can understand all of these features, like I mentioned, the existence of shoulders. You can understand uh, why if you keep increasing the kicking period to even like here, uh, 10,000 nanoseconds. So like waiting a really long time between uh, consecutive kicks, you still get the same feature. So you actually have a limiting amount that you can ionize that is not equal to one. And all of this you can understand by using this approach from nonlinear dynamics where you are understanding these, the structure that exists in your face space. So if you guys want, and for you grad students, we can talk more about what happens when you have a system that is higher dimensional. So all of the stuff that I was talking about, my face space is two dimensional. But there is actually a way that you can take a system whose phase space is four dimensional and you can reduce it to a two dimensional system if you are interested in only studying ionization part. And we can talk about that later, but we're not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with that because you guys wanna go celebrate tenure. Um, I do want to say thank you. <laughs> Um, I want to thank to Jim Crutchfield, uh, who I've been working with uh, most closely for the last couple of years. Uh, at Rice University, Barry's group has been wonderful to me, and uh, the grad students uh, at the time, who were at grad students at the time, who did these experiments, Brendan and Suzanne. Um, and then for, uh, this is my PhD advisor, Kevin Mitchell. We started working on this. These are various. Um, 
uh, funding agencies and various funding sources that we had over the years that supported this research. And then I want to thank Sebastian and uh, for inviting me, and I want to thank you for asking some questions, not too many questions. <laughs> so if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Yeah. So you're saying that the chaos is not sort of random thing. Chaos is not, do not, do not say chaos and random. <laughs> so how do you define chaos? It is the one of the easiest one of the easy ways is sensitivity to initial conditions. That's one of the better ways. Because random is completely that's a completely different bag of systems. Can that be translated to instability? Instability is also yeah, because there's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so I think what's bothering me is that yes. these are closed phase space features. Yes. I, I thought one of uh, sort of the definitions of chaos is that you never closed. So what you're thinking, okay, so one of the things, uh, I'm not going to explain the system, but the picture will be helpful for this. Uh, let's look at this. Uh, so here I have my KM tori, and I have these dots that are all around. So this is a mixture of KM tori and chaotic C. Chaotic C is not closed, KM torus is. <laughs> Is that okay? So I have coexistence. And if I'm inside one of these, I cannot cross outside. Is that okay? Yes? The numbers probably don't make any sense whatsoever. Uh -huh. Since you've somehow fought really hard to turn this quantum system called an atom, uh -huh. into a classical uh -huh. Why not just take a bunch of charges on a tennis ball? You can. It's a real classical system. You can. It, 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 it would do the same. Experiments and uh, these so I haven't, I haven't seen it. The reason why I went with these atomic systems originally, why I got super excited about this, is when you, t when you are in a nonlinear non community, if anybody wants to do an experiment, it's because your system is so sensitive to everything around it. You want to work with a system where you can isolate from everything else. And that's why Rydberg atoms were very exciting, because I know that pretty much anything that's acting on this electron is the electric field that I applied. So I will be able to really closely take whatever I have on my piece of paper and bring it into lab. And if I get some other signature that I didn't expect, I will know that that is the signature because I missed something in the calculations, not because there might be something else that I need to add to my Hamiltonian. So, so now that you've done the calculations, mm -hmm. you've shown that it works out. Yeah. Can't you sort of now go the other way and figure out, okay, if I can have that are pitfalls with a upper bound of interaction mm -hmm. and still be able to see all these paths. I'm Thus, hand off to a bunch of undergraduates and <laughs> to go experimentally demonstrate this stuff. That would be a lot of fun to do. <laughs> and if you send me a bunch of undergrads, I would love to have them to do that. <laughs> yeah. So a quick comment, sir. Yeah. So this, I understand very little about your, this talk, but I think there is uh, some similarity to weather system we work with. So weather system is also deterministic. Yes. So to us, we don't know if you use energy. We don't uh, whether we are in the E1 or E2. Exactly. So we do some example. We sample the initial condition mm -hmm. and 
and do a prediction and if that works, mm -hmm. that's why we have like 60% yep. presentation. Yep. Which I still don't understand what that actually means. The second question is, uh, the, is about scale. Sometimes, you know, the within 10 days, the matter is scale. Yes. But when we talk about climate, it becomes yes. predictable. Yes, yes, exactly. This, this scale, temporary scale, the scale is so, uh, not, you know. So, I mean, so the thing is, yeah, I mean, so here's the thing. You can say, so depending how you're looking at this. So if I, if I say, yeah, I want to care about um, whether or not my electron is ionized or if it's bound, then yes, certain electrons are always going to stay bound and certain electrons are just going to escape. So y you can say after, you know, many, 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 many kicks, I can say that the, the fraction of the electrons that are going to keep getting ionized with any additional kicks is going to be minuscule, so I can just say, okay, they're all going to stay bound for a while. So, um, so there's also some. You can, yeah, but those are, those are the things. Um, so th there's this, um, this is kind of like uh, what happens before the system equilibrates what I'm looking at. And I'm not looking at what happens in the long, um, long time scale. Um, which is a different question which people still look. In this particular field, I'm not, in this particular question, I'm not looking at, you know, what happens on long time scales. Are there any more urgent questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.